church? Yes. I just want you to know it's barely morning because it's 10 and 12. I'm going to rush the church. Anyways, yeah, we can do this. Um, let's go ahead and read the scripture here. Hebrews. King James is a lot of people, it's harder to understand when you're reading it from up here, so I turned it in for a new King James. Okay. 11 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But I like to add the word yet in there. That, in my opinion, is a faith state, not yet seen. I'm in grief already. Amen. There's a good word. All right. Uh, this sermon title, God Doesn't Make Sense. Hmm. But the faith of Jesus does. Infinite power, brothers and sisters, is not subject to reason. Okay? Uh, we have a problem thinking outside the box. God has no God. With him, all things are possible. Uh -huh. And with Margaret, things are possible how she makes Gilbert so asleep every time. <laughs> <laughs> they, must, they must get him up at 3 in the morning and run that kid. <laughs> because, I don't know, for the past month, it's the way it's been. He's just like a rock. As soon as the service is over, he'll be up. <laughs> He's like most of the church. <laughs> That's the only illustration I'm going to have time to give today because time is short. I mean, you guys don't give me much time up here. All right. Romans 10, 17. What does it say? Faith comes by hearing, right? And hearing by the Word of God. Anything that does not have its foundation on God's Word is not of true faith. Okay? Now, I, I have, I, I don't even want to say this, but we all stand in this church at um, an even level. Okay? So, I know emotions were high last week with everything that was going on. Okay? And, uh, I just want to say that today we will not be uh, engaging in the politics of personal destruction. We will not be endorsing candidates or tearing down candidates today. And we will not be discussing how many mag how many go how many bullets go in a magazine. We're going to stick to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, and I'm saying that with a very heavy heart. Okay? And it's not the ringing tone of this church. It's a bump in the road. But you guys, we cannot forget things that have been said. You can't unsee something that you've seen. Okay? So I'm apologizing. This is a two-part sermon. And I'm going to name the first part the slippery slope away from the true faith. And then God's leading is always mind blowing. Okay, so this is going to be kind of a two parter that I'm going to try to slam into like no time. Thank you, Tom. The slippery slope. John 18. John 18. I'll get there to say that. Okay, we're going to start down the slippery slope. And, and what I'm doing this for is to show you a checkup on how not to be. Okay? And then we'll get into the more substantive of what we should be and how to be it. Okay? John chapter 18, and we're going to begin in verse 28. And it says... Then they led Jesus...
from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. And it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the Praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Okay. You're, you're captured all that. I don't have time to get in and break this all down. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Now you got to remember, they drug Pilate out of bed for this. This is early in the morning, okay? And he's probably already got some kind of attitude going on. Would you think? I mean, how many people like to be waking up? Especially early in the morning, and you're the man. Right? Now, he's the man, supposed to be in charge, but he's being drug up, isn't he? you got, you got to hear this. Okay. They answered, okay, and said, If he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said unto them, You take him, and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful. For us to put anyone to death. Ooh, this thing just got serious, didn't it? That the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying what death he would die. Then Pilate entered into the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you of this concerning me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Can you hear the attitude there? You, your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you unto me. What have you done? Do you, do you hear the pride here? Am I a Jew? Right? This is the first step down the slippery slope, which Lucifer took in heaven long ago. And it begins with a great big word, P. R, but finish it for me. Pride. 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 Pride is the very first step down the slippery slope. Now, if we continue on, John 36, uh, 8, 18 and 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out, again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault with this man. Distraction by others from the truth, brothers and sisters, is another step down the slippery slope. If you turn your Bibles to Luke 23, Luke 23, and we'll be reading 1 to 7. Y'all there? Amen. Then the whole number and the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Then Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him and said, It is as you say. So Pilate said to the chief priests and to the crowd, I find no fault with this man. But they were more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching through all out Judea, beginning with Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. As soon as he knew that he had belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. The next step down the slippery slope is shifting responsibility to somebody else. So we have pride, distraction by others from the truth, 
and shifting of responsibility. Let's turn our Bibles now to Matthew 27. And we will be reading 15 to 24. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at the time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that he had handed him over because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife said to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two of you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. What then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? If that's not marked in your Bible, that's the most important question in the Bible, okay? You should put something there. That is the most important question this Bible will ever ask you. They all said to him, let him be crucified. Then the governor said, why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of this just person. You see to it. Brothers and sisters, the last step down the slippery slope is neutrality. There is no neutrality. Period. There is absolutely no true neutrality in the position and the conflict of the ages. If you choose to not make a decision, you have made a decision, period. Now we're going to shift gears into a more pleasant speak. <laughs> the faith of Jesus that always wins the victory. Let's turn our Bibles to Hebrews 11. One to three. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things, like I say, I like to say, not yet seen. Yet's not there, but I love that. Okay? For by it elders obtain a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen we're not made of things which are visible. Does that make sense? It doesn't make sense, really, that you can make something out of nothing. <laughs> but this is God we're talking about. The infinite, holy, almighty God that can do all things in anything. Because when he speaks, it is. How it happens, I haven't got a clue. But rationally, it just doesn't work. How do you get something out of nothing? God can. I can't. God doesn't ask us to be <coughs> successful, brothers and sisters, but He asks us to be faithful. Faithful. Okay? Let's turn our Bibles to Judges. Joshua, Judges, Ruth. Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. Judges in six. It's hard to get a new Bible. Pages almost stick together. Here. Who do you think we're going to talk about here? Gideon. That's right. Gideon. Okay, six and fourteen. Y'all there? Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? 
So he said to him, Oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the weakest or the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. As one man. Isn't that amazing? Doesn't God love to tie his hands behind his back? And, and how, how, does this, how does this fella see himself, this Gideon? Who am I? I'm the least of all my people. And even more than that, I'm the least of my father's house. Ooh, you think he's open for blessing? You think he's in a good place? You think God loves to grab a hold of people like that? Absolutely. Ooh. Ooh, we're out of something here. This is completely the opposite of pride, is it not? Wow. All right, let's turn to 36, verse 36. So Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand as you have said, Look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only, and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl of water. Then Gideon said to God, Do not be angry with me. Please let me speak just once more. Let me test, I pray, just once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece, but on all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on all the ground. There's some things right there that don't make sense to it. But you know what? I mean, this... To ask God for a test in the first place is a pretty big deal. And then to say it again, and have him flip around, <coughs> this is a good thing. Anyways. Oh, he did? He, he woke up early? Um, he must be going. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm late. See? 12.07. He's right on time. <laughs> He, he's like he's like a cat. We got some cats at 5.30 in the morning. The one will just start to squall her. She just knows it's time to eat. And that's like, I'm busy. Can you just go away? Oh! I, I never seen an animal that can make so many noises. It's unbelievable. So you got to feed her. But she ain't going to shut up, you know. Hey, there's a thought. If you keep praying, Maybe God will answer that prayer, huh? <laughs> okay. All right, chapter 7. Now, this is going to be a long read, okay? Because we're going to have to get through this. I've, I've trimmed up other stuff so we can spend some time here. Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the people, I'm on chapter 7, okay, who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Herod. So the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many. For me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hand is saved. Now therefore proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead, and twenty... 2,000 people returned, and then 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Bring them down, man, bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you, and whom and whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. 
Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. And the number of those who lacked putting their hands to their mouth was 300 men. But all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. Now, what do you think the significance is there? Do you, do you believe there's any significance in what the Lord's doing here? These guys that are grabbing the water and drinking, they know what they're there for, don't yes. they? They're engaged. They're warriors, right? And the rest of these guys, they don't even belong here. Okay? So now that you got the picture, God's trimming these numbers down to 300 because these guys are serious. They may not be professional, but they're serious. God doesn't need professional. <laughs> then the Lord said to Gideon, By the 300 men who lacked, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. So the people took provisions and their trumpets in their hands, and he sent away all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and retained those 300 men. Now the camp of Midian was below in, in the valley. It happened on the same night, the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered it unto your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, God is so tender. Go down to the camp and with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say. And afterward, your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. Now the Midianites and Amalekites, all the people of the east, were lying in the valley, by new, as numerous as locusts, and their, cam and their camels were without number as the sand by the seashore in multitude. And when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. He said, I have had a dream. <clears throat> to my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and struck it so it fell and overturned, and the tent collapsed. Then his companion answered and said, This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon the sons of Joash, a man of Israel, into his hand God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. Boy, this is something, isn't it? Can you imagine? Could you not believe after that? Could your heart not be full of unbelief after that? Whew. And so it was, when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he worshipped, he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. Then he divided the 300 men into three companies. And he put a trumpet into every man's hand. I want you to pay real close attention to this now. Because this is the typology of the 144,000. And this is the end story right here. Given to us in the Old Testament. Okay? Listen closely. I'm going to start back at 16. Then he divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet into each man's hand with empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look at me and do likewise. Watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, and all who are with me, then you also shall blow the trumpets on every side of the whole camp and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just as they had posted the watch, and they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. What are, what are pitchers? Why is this doing this? Is your coat uh, touching? I haven't touched I haven't done No, anything. your coat. No. Anyways, the devil won't want you to hear this. That's what it is. Now, these pitchers, what? They're earthen vessels, right? Okay? Get that, get that picture in your head. I'm 20 here. Then the three companies blew the trumpet and broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And every man stood in his place all around the camp. And the whole army ran out, ran and cried out and, the, and fled. When the 300 blew the trumpets, 
The Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp, and the army fled to Beth Achai, yeah, so, towards Zeria, as far as the border of Abel. I, I have a hard time with these names. Miloah by Tabath. The men of Israel gathered together from Naphtali, Asher, and Manasseh and pursued the Midianites. The Gideon, then Gideon sent messengers throughout all the mounts of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and seize them from the watering places as far as Beth Barah and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered together and seized the watering places as far as Beth Barah and the Jordan. And they captured two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they killed at the wine press. Ooh, there's a significant word, the wine press. Do you see this picture? Do you see this? These guys, 300 men, are, are, are camped around this, this humongous enemies of God, okay? that you can't even number that there's so many. And what are they armed with? A trumpet and an earthen vessel with a light in it. Brothers and sisters, are you an earthen vessel with a light in it? Hello? Hello? Is this not a beautiful picture? What can God do if we stop being insubordinate? What can God do with the people that are full of faith? Now, faith, we fight. No faith, we fight each other. Okay? That's what we do. With no faith, we fight each other. Without faith, we have confusion of one believing one thing and one believing another. Victory, brothers and sisters, is always in God's hands. When the odds are overwhelming, God overwhelms the odds. Amen. It's just that simple. This is a real simple, simple sermon. October 22nd of this year will be 172 years since God has moved into the most holy apart. Shall we follow him and stop resisting? Stop resisting. That's what God wants us to do. There's a, the Bible talks about in Revelation, there's a door that has been shut that no man can open. Okay? The first apartment. There's a door that is open, the second apartment, brothers and sisters, that no man can shut. Okay? Adventists know this, they understand it, but we're not faithfully going to be with Jesus in the most holy apartment. We want to be with the evangelicals and try to get in the first apartment door. The door's shut. It's shut. We were raised for a particular purpose, brothers and sisters. It's not about current events and things that are going on. These are nothing. These are distractions. Do you see what happens when people are faithful to the Lord? They have their trumpet. And their light. It's just that simple. It really is. God is only limited, only limited by the people He can use. We are the ones limited. God can do anything. With 300 men, He took out the Midianites, the Malachites. And he wants to take and finish this thing. Do you think it's his will that we still be here? No. No. God wants us to go home. And I want to go home. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we are the people in whom he has called to finish this work. Will we decide to be in agreement even at one minute with him? And not only be the call, but be the chosen. Amen. I want this generation to finish the work. <clears throat> Our closing song is 6 -0.